lasting possession, and I will be their God. There's a number of things that unfold in this chapter and a half. The first is this. I want to ask this question. What's in a name? What's in a name? Do any of you know what your name means? You know, I'm not sure why I was called William J. When I was little, I was BJ. Never been Billy. Settled in on Bill for all of my days. There was a period when I was in college that I was kind of bored with Bill. I don't know about where you grew up, but in the 60s and 70s in Kansas, Illinois, about three quarters of the boys were Bill, and about a third of the girls were Billy. It was a boring name, okay? And so I wanted to go by my middle name. I want to be Jay. Never caught on. Couldn't get anybody to do that. So I'm just plain old Bill. I'm, get, I'm that thing that you comes in the mail at the first of the month that you really don't want. Oh, come on, folks. That was funny. <laughs> Thank you. What's in a name? Our daughter, Jenai, was named after a missionary. Gladys Isleward was called by the people of China, Jenai, the one who loves the people. And we chose that name for her in particular. In the Old Testament, matter of fact, in the New Testament as well, names meant so much more to the Hebrew people than they seem to do to us today. Names mean a lot to God. We read here that God appears to Abram. Abram's 99 years old and God starts making promises. He's what we would think is the end of life. And God starts telling him, these things are going to happen to you. But first of all, he identifies himself. I am God Almighty. In Hebrew, El Shaddai. Maybe you've heard the song by Amy Grant. El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. And there is nothing that I can't do. Even if you are 99. And you and Sarah don't have a child yet. He identifies himself as the one with no limits, with no bounds, with no inabilities. I am God. Do you see him as El Shaddai? Do you recognize the Almighty as we come before him in praise and song, as you go about your life each and every day, maybe some struggles? Do you realize that we worship the one who is boundless, who has no limits? But there's nothing that he can't do. And he sets about changing names. Kind of like I wanted to do when I was younger in BJ. He says, Abram, or Abram. Abram means exalted father. And he says, I will call you from now on Abraham, Abraham, which means father of a multitude. Father of a multitude. Abraham probably had to scratch his head a little bit at that point. Later in the chapter, we'll find out that he speaks to Abraham and he says, I'm going to change the name of your wife as well. No longer shall she be called Sarai. She will be called Sarah. Sarah. Any Sarahs in your families? Do you know what Sarah means? Surely you do. Sarah means princess. God says, Abraham, your barren wife, you're 99, she's 90, you don't have any kids with her, you're going to, surprise, surprise, <laughs> we're going to call her princess, because from her shall come kings, royalty. Can you think of any? David? Solomon, Hezekiah, Josiah. How about Jesus? See, there's a promise that's unfolding. Why are we spending all this time in Genesis talking about the things of the beginning? Because the Bible is one story. It's the story of God's redemption of mankind. 
And there is a promise that is being completed, being fulfilled, and it's being woven through the story. And even here with Abraham and Sarah, a mother of kings, including the king of kings, shall come from her, King Jesus. Matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, we're told that we will get a new name. You ever sing an old hymn, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine? Oh yes, it's mine. You want to sing that, Rose? What a beautiful song. There's a new name written down in glory. Even for us, for you and me, who follow Jesus. A name that will be our identity. Who we are in God's eyes. Well, this is great news for Abraham. He's all excited, I'm sure. You know, he's probably got to take a little nitro tablet because it's got his heart rate up more than it should be. You know, got to rub a little bit of that asper cream on his knuckles and his knees because his arthritis is acting up. But he has to respond. How do you respond to El Shaddai? How do you respond to God Almighty? Well, the first thing is found in the words of God Himself. In verse 1, God speaks to Abraham and says, Walk before me and be blameless. Walk before me and be blameless. It's just, all He's saying is, live in relationship with me. And blameless here doesn't even play out in perfection. Look at Abraham's life. The Bible doesn't hide the warts and the, the wounds and the ill behavior of our heroes. But God says, walk with me. Live your life in relationship to me. Forsaking all other loves, all the gods of these nations around you, I am your God. And verse 3 says that Abraham fell on his face. Fell his face. Humility, submission, and worship. Abraham knew in whose presence he stood, and so he falls to his knees and to his face. Submission to God. This is who you are and what you require of me. I surrender all and worship. You are good. And there is no other God but you. I worship you. Do you ever just fall prostrate before God? Do you ever kneel before the Lord? Sometimes that's hard. You've got artificial knees. Joints don't work. I always tell people I can't get down on the ground because if I do... I can't get back up. <laughs> Several of us understand that, don't we? Maybe, <laughs> maybe we just need to prostrate the heart. To lay flat before Him. To kneel before Him. To fall on our face before Him. You know, I get the image sometimes of those who follow the Muslim faith. Have you ever seen the prayer posture of the Muslim? Knelt and head down, forehead on the floor. And I think sometimes <laughs> those who believe in a different God show a greater devotion than I do. And I'm a lifelong follower of God. Abraham fell on his face in humility, submission, and worship. And then God says, in verse 9, You, Abraham, and your descendants after you shall keep my covenant. Shall keep my covenant. This is our response. To walk with Him, to fall before Him, and to be faithful throughout life. But that brings me to the third thing that I want to talk about is simply this idea of covenant. We keep using that word in the most sterile sense a covenant is a contract. And I really hate looking at it that way. You know, I have a contract with U.S. Cellular. I have a contract with Wells Fargo Home Mortgage. 
Fortunately, my cars are paid for, but maybe you have a contract with a bank that holds the lien on your vehicle. Maybe, after 50 years, you still have a contract with Sally May for your college education. Isn't that a crazy thing? We tend to think of contracts, and aren't, it's, it's, a, it's a business. We don't do business with God. We enter relationship with God. You see the diff? We don't do business with God. This isn't a transaction. This is the entering of relation. This is more like when you stood before God and man and you said, I take you to be my lawfully wedded husband or wife. To have and to hold for richer, for poor, in sickness and health till death do us part. You enter relationship. Covenant. God says in verse 7, I am entering into an everlasting covenant with you. A covenant that extends to your descendants. And if you've been here over this study in the book of Genesis, quick quiz, are you and I, who probably don't have a drop of Hebrew blood within us, if we are Christians, are we descendants of Abraham? Say yes, nod your head. Yes, we are. Remember, Paul said that through Christ, by our faith, we are descendants of Abraham because he's the father of faith when we go back to the book of Genesis. And so there is a covenant that extends all the way down and through Jesus to you and to me. And so God reassures Abraham I think it was the first song that we sang, God is Good. Was that our first one? And I sat there and I thought, one, it pertains to my sermon, but two, it pertains to my life. When there are shadows, when there's sadness, when there's hurt, when there's ache, when, there, when life stinks, God is there. God is good. And He's good all the time. Thanks for the reminder today, worship team. And so God has to speak to Abraham. Remember, he's 99 years old. He and his aged wife don't have a child of promise yet. Yes, they have Ishmael, whom we talked about previously. So God has to give him some reassurances. In chapter 17, verse 9, he says the first reassurance is this, the very ground beneath your feet. Remember, Abraham, that I called you here. I said, pack up your bags, take off, head west, and when you get where I want you to stop, I'll tell you. Guys, you try that with your wife this afternoon. Pull the U-Haul up, say, we're heading west. Where are we going? I don't know. God will tell us when we get there. Yeah, it's going to fly. And he says, it's the ground beneath your feet. I have brought you here to Canaan. And this is yours. And it will belong to your descendants after you. I've kept my word is what God's saying. I told you I would show you a land and a half. And then he speaks to him in chapter 17, verse 19, of the child of promise. A child not yet born. We know him by the name of Isaac. The child that will be born to Abraham and Sarah about a year from this point in time, as we find out in chapter 18. God says, when this child, not yet born, matter of fact, not yet even conceived, arrives, you will know, I am a God of my word. I am a God who keeps my promise. And in your old age, you'll hold that child in your arms. I find it interesting that in chapter 17, Abraham, guess what, falls on his face and laughs. I wonder if that was a joyful laugh. <laughs> How cool it's going to be. I'm going to have a baby in my old age. I'm going to be getting up at 2 in the morning to give a bottle and I'm 100 years old. <laughs> or was it an incredulous laugh? you got to be kidding me. This is an impossibility. But you are El Shaddai. 
God Almighty for whom nothing is impossible. Interestingly enough, in chapter 18, Sarah will laugh. She kind of gets in trouble for it. Makes you wonder. Abraham didn't get in trouble. Sarah did, but that's how the story unfolds. Sarah will also laugh. She will say, well, I in my old age and my husband in his older age, will we experience this joy of having a baby? And she laughed. And the angel of the Lord who was present speaking with Abraham said, hmm, why did she laugh? And Sarah kind of pulls back. She's frightened. She goes, I didn't laugh. And the angel of the Lord says, well, let's not argue about it. But yes, you did. Let's just be honest. Because you see, God says, I will keep my word and that will reassure you of my covenant with you. And then it gets really word, weird. He gives them the sign of the covenant, which takes up about half of chapter 17. The sign of the covenant for the Hebrew people was circumcision. Chapter 17, verses 9 through 27. And it's regardless of age, regardless of nationality, whether you're free man or slave. And I ask this question, I, you know, what a weird sign of the covenant. Why, God? I, you know, couldn't I just have a cross or something? I listened to a sermon by Alistair Begg, a reformed preacher, trying to answer the question Why? Alistair gave three reasons. I'm just going to give them to you. They're his. I hear what he's saying. Do with them what you will. One, he says, it was a sign of commitment to and identification with God's people. It marked the Jewish male as Jewish. We don't have to reach back too awful far. World War II, Nazi Germany. Identification of Hebrew race, often used as a distinguishing mark, an examination. I belong to God, and God belongs to me. Number two, it represented a discarding of or a separation from past heathen ways. All the other gods that might have filled their experience. We're not there yet, but when we get to the story of Jacob, when Jacob flees from his father-in-law Laban with his wife Rachel, Rachel takes with her the household gods. All the little statues. Why would she do that? You know, they weren't just cute little put-on-the-mantle decorations. We'll talk about it when we get there. See, that's, that's kind of a hook. You have to come back. <laughs> Cheap. Cheap way of doing it, but that's me. Rachel will do that. But what happens here is God says, you are not like everybody else. You're not like the nations. You're not to worship the little bitly idols. You are to worship El Shaddai. And number three, it was a sign of submission to the life that which, to which God had called you. A submission to the life to which God had called you. He will establish that Hebrew male children would be circumcised on the eighth day. But at this point, if you read the story, Abraham at 99 is circumcised. Ishmael at 13 <laughs> is circumcised. Every male within his household is circumcised in chapter 17. Regardless of age, regardless of nationality, if they were to follow God, this was what they did. That changes, of course, in the New Testament. But that's a sermon for another day. The sign of the covenant spoke of belonging, of separation, of purity, and of loyalty. Well, there's a fourth thing that I want to talk about, and it's this. I want to build more on that child of promise, because God will point out that it is Isaac and not Ishmael. Let me read just a little bit. In chapter 17, verses 15 through 19. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. 
And Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, No, Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you will call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and his descendants after him. Do you hear Abraham? Can't we just do this with Ishmael? Do you hear him? And God says, no. But the son that will be born to you and Sarah, 100 years old and 90 years old. Let the, yes, they lived a little bit longer than you and I do. But nonetheless, they were old people. And Ishmael says, I don't want to get up at 2 o'clock for feedings. How about Ishmael? <laughs> and God says, no. Isaac. And just for the fun of it, and you probably know this, what's in a name? What does Isaac mean? Laughter. And isn't it interesting that Abraham laughed and Sarah laughed and laughter was born to them a year later. Isn't that cool? Isaac, not Ishmael. In chapter 18, 9 through 15, we get the same thing. The angel of the Lord, matter of fact, three men were told. It might be three angels. There's a lot of debate amongst theologians about chapter 18 and who this is. One even thinks that it's the pre-incarnate Christ. God himself, the Lord, has appeared because Abraham refers to him as Lord. He uses the word Adonai, another word maybe you've heard in song. I won't read it, but 9 through 15 of chapter 18, these angels of the Lord speak again of the promise and say, a year from now, a year from now, you will bear this son, Isaac. And I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but very quickly, Ishmael is spoken of too. Back in chapter 17, verses 18 and 20, remember, Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God says, no, not Ishmael, but Isaac. And in verse 20, God says, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. You, know, you, you love this teenage boy that's running around. He says, I've heard you, and behold, I will bless him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. And I don't want to make too much of it, and this is just my opinion. Do with it what you want. Toss it out with the bathwater. But I hear God promise Abraham that Ishmael will be the father of 12 princes. Abraham and Sarah will have Isaac. Isaac and Rebekah will have Jacob. Jacob and his two wives and two concubines, that's another sermon for another day, will have 12 sons, the 12 patriarchs of Israel. God gave to Ishmael the same that he gave to Isaac. And I think that's interesting because remember, Ishmael's there because Abraham and Sarah ran ahead of God. They tried to force God's hand, mess things up. But even when we mess things up, God brings forth good. Can we remember that? Even when we mess things up, God can and does bring forth good. And he does so in the life of Ishmael. And God says, I will establish my everlasting covenant with Isaac. Okay. Shall we tie a bow on this and call it a day? Last thing. Chapter 18, verse 14. I've not read from chapter 18, but I do want to read verse 14. This angel of the Lord is speaking to Abraham and Sarah. And this is the key, I call it. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? Highlight that in your Bible if you're one to highlight in your Bible. I know some people don't. But if you do, is anything too difficult for the Lord? You see in verse 13, Sarah said, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? And God says, Is anything 
too difficult for the Lord. He gives a child to Abraham and Sarah. Centuries later, a child will be born of a virgin, Mary, and raised by her and Joseph. They are descendants of Abraham and Sarah. They are people who lived under an everlasting covenant that God made in chapter 17 of Genesis. And it is this Jesus who looks at you and I and invites us into his new covenant that is made through his sacrifice on Golgotha. And when we are willing to enter that covenant, we hear him say, I will be your God and you shall be my people. And this too is an everlasting covenant. And he asks us only to do what he asked of Abraham. I am God Almighty. Walk with me. When we leave this property today, don't leave behind the promises of God, the invitation of God, the power of God. God. Walk with Him. And whatever you are facing, whatever you believe of His Word that just seems to be impossibly Impossible to bring about. Remember who he is. He is El Shaddai. And there is nothing that he can't do. Would you like to walk with him? Jesus says that he who is weary, that he who is carrying a heavy burden, let him come to me. You'll find that my burden's light. My yoke is easy. Come to me. Jesus is inviting you. And we're going to sing. And if you would like to come to him, we invite you to make that public. And I'll be here waiting to meet you and speak with you. Would you stand as we sing? I'm grateful for your presence this morning as we unite with one voice and one heart before the throne of God to praise Him. So glad that you're here. I want to encourage you to come back next week. You, you have been here for four years plus. Know that 
I'm kind of laid back, and I have no idea what next Sunday will look like because we venture into Sodom and Gomorrah. There's fire and brimstone that rains from heaven, and I am just not a fire and brimstone preacher. You know, so I may just show that old movie, Towering Inferno. You remember that one? <laughs> you know, we'll just let it burn and uh, let it go. You know, so bring your popcorn and your slippers, and all will be good. Otherwise, maybe I'll preach on that. Uh, that's, that's where we're going next. Pray for me, because it's a little bit out of my genre, a little bit out of my, my normal flow, but we cannot pass it over. It is a part of the unfolding story. All right. I don't know about you all, but I am glad to be past the 2 a.m. feedings. <laughs> but the question is, is anything impossible for God? And the answer is no. So let's sing. <laughs> 